offers resistance. And this time we jumped way past the 200-day moving average, like 100 points higher, and way past the 50-week moving average, I think about 90 points higher. This is a major bullish reversal. So in another perspective, gold is showing tremendous relative strength compared to, say, the stock market, the oil market, the junk bond market, and, and a whole lot of other things. The, the only thing that is looking equally good is the Treasury bonds, which I regard to be a black hole. It's a black hole. The Treasury bonds are a black hole. It's attracting capital across the world. Countries are having problems with their stock market, so money goes into the Treasury bonds. Countries are having problems with their currency, so investors are moving out of their own domestic currency and into Treasury bonds. It's a black hole. It's not a good investment. It's a black hole. It's attracting global capital in a climax event that's going to result in the vanishing of the dollar. It's very interesting what's happening. This black hole has never been seen like this before. You have trouble in all kinds of asset classes, in all continents, and lots of economic justification for the problems, and money's moving into the supposed safe haven, where I think some of it is going to be lost, maybe more than a little bit. So we could, we could talk for an hour about the treasure bond black hole, but I'd rather not discuss that today because we've got some really good things lined up. Definitely. And what I was going to ask you about next is if you can expand a little bit on what do you think has changed that is making investors fearful and want a safe haven in the first place? Well, you have all kinds of news of bank problems. Now, bear in mind that, that since Lehman, we've not made one single constructive reform move toward remedy. Not one single move. The move to zero percent, that was to enable Wall Street to make money on a carry trade, bond carry trade. That was to make free the money in the interest rate swap derivative machinery so they could have artificial treasury bond demand when no one's buying treasury bonds. This black hole is fed by zero percent and the derivative machinery, multi-trillion dollar derivative machinery. Okay, so they're seeing bank problems. They're, they're hearing about threats of bail-ins. They're hearing about negative interest rates. These are not normal things. It's much worse. You're getting finally what I forecasted in, uh, I gave a, about four different interviews during Christmas holidays, and each one I outlined and described with some degree of detail how the expiration of the oil hedges would happen in January, February, March, and you're going to see a lot of energy firms fall and their banking partners realize tremendous losses. Well, it's happening now, but people are also noticing the, the shipping distress. I think there's actually an unspoken global strike now where shippers refuse to accept treasury bills. I'm not, not I don't mean shippers, the people who lease the ships, the people who use the ships to, to ship products like containers. They're refusing to accept treasury bills in payment, so the ships don't go anywhere. The people are also seeing tremendous amounts of job cuts amidst this <coughs> uh, sluggish recovery. I mean, it's like there's a law. You must describe the sluggish recovery. Now, fear is growing. Okay, you have, you have leaking information about new currency systems. You have the RMB usage Chinese currency, much more for trade payments. You're seeing bypasses of the U.S. dollar, like Russia and China are not using the dollar anymore for any of their oil trade. You have Iran coming on saying they want only euros, which is exactly what Saddam Hussein did that earned him an invasion. You know, I think people who are a little bit smarter are noticing that QE, the monetary policy, is not working. It wasn't designed to work. It was put on in 2012 to cover the Treasury bonds, de absent demand to cover the U.S. government debt that no one wanted to buy. It wasn't to solve the systemic problem. It was a patch to make sure that the U.S. government didn't default on its debt. So that didn't produce anything positive. In fact, it pretty much raised a cost structure everywhere and wiped out a good deal of prof profitability in companies. I, I believe that very basically... Basically, to describe the QE as a monetary policy of printing money and covering uh, treasury bonds destroys capital. By eradicating the profit margin, increasing costs, 
it puts equipment out of business and takes it offline. I mean, everything that the Euro Central Bank has done with its gadgets and all of its different, it's got its own little alphabet soup of, of junk facilities. They're not working. The sanctions against Russia, they're not working. They're about to be reversed. You've got all this war going on in Syria and, and Ukraine, and people are beginning to wonder, what is the United States policy all about except war? So people are starting to hunker down into gold. And, you know, I, I, think, I think that there's something a little bit uglier going on, and that is that earthlings are awakening to the constant endless war from the Satanist Western elites and their plans. And it's just not working. So if you, if you want to light a fire across the whole world, people are going to start to invest in gold in a big, big way. And that's what I think is going on now. But the part that I love the most is that on a relative strength basis, apart from the black hole and treasure bonds, there's only one asset group that's doing well, and that's gold. I think it's outperforming, say, farmland right now. Now, one other thing that is being affected by the fear investors are feeling right now is the stock market. Now, I'm not a technical analyst, but if you look at the U.S. stock market charts, for example, the chart of the Dow, the Dow crashed in August, but then when it rose back up, it didn't make a new high. And then it crashed again, and this month it made a lower low. So it seems like the trend is lower highs and lower lows, which therefore is a downtrend. What do you see? The same thing. Let me put some more flesh on those bones. I am a technical analyst. I, I'm not, well, you could say I'm a professional one, but it's not my main focus in the newsletter. I, I'm, I'm no novice to technical analysis. And here's what I see. First of all, you have a critical bust going on in the energy sector. It seems to be the last straw to point out the economic depression. I mean, I don't go with the, the nonsense. I just don't follow the, the, the path of, of the propaganda artists out there who say, well, the sluggish recovery is, uh, you know, making some progress. No, it's not. We've got a vicious recession with massive feedback loops, and the only thing positive out there that they can point to is that the unemployment rate, as they measure from the percentage of workers who are collecting state, state insurance for unemployment, that's going down. But since when is that unemployment? Now, that's not the unemployment rate. That's unemployed no longer receiving their insurance. So that's not a progress point. Okay, here, here's what I see. We have, we have some breakdowns in the chart. Okay, I'll get to your point, which is excellent, and I'll put a little bit more description on it. But we have bearish crossovers. Okay, when a 200-day when a moving average gets crossed by the 50-day moving average, which is more volatile up and down, if it's, if it's averaging only 50 days, it's less stable than averaging 200 days. So the 50-day moving average crossed over and went down. Oh, that's very bearish, very bearish. And you saw something similar with the, the weekly chart. You also had a retest top failure. Okay, what I mean by that, as you were describing, we came down off a top several months ago, but when we tried to continue up and go beyond it, we failed. Exactly when the bearish moving average crossovers were taking place. But here's where that retest failure looked even worse. It had higher volume than the most recent top. That's very significant. A retest with higher volume. That means like you're trying to get more people to push the car than before. All right, bring in your other neighbors. Bring in four other guys. And it still didn't work. All right, that's a bigger, more important failure. So we've had important changes since January. I think this is like a, a sentiment shift since January. I call it a new dawn. I've been describing a, a new sheriff in town for the last couple of years. I don't know anybody who's used that terminology, but the new sheriff is from the east, and the new sheriff is calling some new rules. And I believe that, that there's been a movement the last few months to bring about some very important critical changes, and some of the smart money is noticing this, is adapting to this, and is responding in a big way with the stock market. So I agree with you. This is a change. We, we've gone suddenly from an uptrend to a downtrend 
without even a hint of a multiple months of leveling off. This is a reversal. With a failed retest with higher volume and critical moving average crossovers in a bearish way. This, this is looking like a truly horrible chart. Now, besides in the U.S., are other countries' stock markets in trouble as well? I think a better question is which other foreign stock markets are doing well, and the answer is none. None. Not even the robust Hong Kong market for stocks. And I had a feature story. You know, it's not my own. I didn't, don't mean to say it, it's an original, but I had a feature story in the uh, February Gold Report that I post for Hattrick Letter. You had a reversal in the Hong Kong property market. This is the sort of thing that, that's leading stock markets down. In Brazil, it's the declining uh, real currency, which is down about 70 or 80 percent in the last three or four years. So that's leading their stock market down. Uh, in Europe, you've got sanctions and you've got the, uh, the, the human dumping of garbage going on. I actually forecasted correctly um, a major terrorist event last autumn. I noticed that not only were, was there human garbage, I'm sorry, the, uh, the North African and some Middle Eastern Arabs being dumped in Europe, and I noticed something really important regarding this dumping of the Arab refugees. They're not Syrian. They're all kinds. I mean, I have a client in Italy who said, Jim, are you calling it the Syrian refugees? They're, they're, they're Moroccan. They're Tari Tunisian. They're all kinds. They're not, they're not just Syrian. They're all kinds. This is a dumping process. And I asked a critical question. You know, if you're, if you're you know, Mr. Mohammed and you have a wife and two kids and you need to get to Europe in order to find a new life, how on earth are you going to pay for the passage? They're being paid by the NGOs out of the U.S. government. This is a dumping process. Okay, so I made a forecast that if they're dumping tens of thousands of Arabs, refugees into Italy and Germany and France, then this was a smokescreen for moving in some terrorists, and we're going to see a big terrorist event somewhere in a major European city. I said this in August and September, and there it was, Paris, France. Okay, so you've got these refugee problems, an increase in assaults and rapes all across Europe, France, Germany, Sweden, people being killed in robberies. you got all kinds of problems. you got the Russian sanctions. you got demands for support of Turkey that are not being met. And, and how's... How is an economy in Europe supposed to behave in response? So it's seeing distress. People are saying, well, I can, I can point to any of 12 reasons not to invest in the European stock market. So the DAX in Germany is doing bad. The CAC in France is doing bad. The FTSE in England is doing bad. These are all doing bad. They're, they're, they're also suffering from basic profit struggles and currency distress. All kinds of countries. <clears throat> this is a universal problem right now, Eli, and uh, it's not going away until we do the right thing. I've got a you know, kind of a funny, it, it, funny little story. Several clients and, and some interview hosts have said, but Jim, haven't, haven't they really tried everything? Nothing seems to be working. I said, no, they haven't tried everything. They haven't liquidated the big banks. They haven't installed the gold standard. They haven't removed the treasury bond uh, black hole. They haven't done a default related to that on U.S. government debt. They haven't done everything. There's no gold standard. We're doing everything but the right thing. There's a joke in Europe that says the Americans will do all the wrong things, make all the wrong decisions before they do the right thing. So we're doing everything but liquidate the banks and install the gold standard. It will come first in trade, then in bank reserves, and then in currencies. This is global, Eli. And, and that's why I think we're on the major cusp for something related positive to gold. I think there's going to be a gigantic bandwagon worldwide in favor of gold. It's going to jump on it, and we're going to see a whole lot of new currencies that are gold-backed. And the pressure will be on because they're going to achieve critical mass, which is what I've been making a point on for a couple of years. They're going to achieve critical mass because there's going to be a sufficient number of countries involved 
to maybe cover, say, 75, 80%, maybe 85% of global trade. So any country that doesn't participate, they're looking at the third world. Now, we're going to see a, a lot of positive events, I think, this year regarding gold. I mean, you, you can look at specific examples like the Shanghai Gold Fix is taking control from London. Yeah, the Shanghai uh, Gold Exchange is offering RMB-based, you know, Chinese currency-based futures contracts for gold that actually deliver in gold, unlike what the COMEX does. They don't deliver in gold. You want to buy a gold contract in New York on the COMEX? Fine. I don't expect to get any gold as part of the contract. In other words, constant violation of futures contracts and no lawsuits and no criminal prosecution. They're selling gold without delivering gold. <clears throat> That's just a control device. All right, so we're going to see a lot of interesting positive events in gold this year. And unfortunately, it's going to be amidst ruins of the global economy and the global financial structure. Now, if I could just ask, like, you're saying that countries are going to start backing their currency with gold. I mean, the price of gold right now is way too low for that to actually to be feasible, right? I mean, there's way too much currency in the world. So do, wouldn't the price of gold have to go, have to be set much, much higher? Exactly. And that's, that's the plan. How high do you see the price of gold going? Well, I, I see several steps. I'd like to outline the steps and maybe put a, little, a few words behind them. Um, <clears throat> I think we're going to see um, the big banks of the world realize we need to conform to Basel III and the rules related. Uh, we need to load up on some gold and put them in our bank reserves, now Tier 1 asset, as they call it. And when everybody's in place, this could actually be part of the reason why gold is doing well in the last month. Big banks are buying gold. And once that's all in place, then they kind of wave to each other and say, all right, systems go, and they double the gold price. And then suddenly you're at, you know, between 2000 and 2500 And these banks are not fully recapitalized, but they've got a lot better condition than they had before. Then the next stage comes when after that has been the case for a while, like several months have passed and we're still over 2,000 with some retests on the downside that are successful. In other words, increased volume to push down the gold price and it doesn't go below 2,000 and that's seen as a positive event and signal. Then you're going to see the mining companies decide, all right, let's start working toward opening up these mines that we've put in mothballs. So you're still not going to get the new mine supply while you have all this new demand. So if you don't get that new supply coming in to meet the demand, and it takes much longer for the mining companies to achieve the new supply, then the gold price is going to continue rising with this new demand from the banks and the new realization among world investors that gold's in an uptrend, it's rising, well, I'm going to jump on that. But it might take a billion dollars to open up and bring back online uh, a shut-down gold mine. For environmental reasons, a costly process has been, has been manifested and realized in the last year of sealing up the shut-down mines. You can't just walk away with holes in the ground. You've got to seal it because they leak. All right, so that will take us way past 2,500, probably closer to four or 5,000. And then, then comes the serious demand for all the different global gold-based currencies. And the big banks are going to say, well, you know, we need to get rid of all of these sovereign bonds. It makes no sense to have debt as a banking core asset. That's a very important point that highlights how sick our global financial system is. The basis and core foundation is debt. It's designed for a systemic collapse when you get too much debt. So that's what we're seeing now after 45 years since the Bretton Woods Accord has gone away. So you have lots of steps here, and I, I think we're going to get eventually past 10000 on the gold price and get somewhere like three or 400 on the silver price. So given all these multiple steps that I just described, 
I think we're going to be on a, a rather impressive march that's not going to take, say, five or six years. I think it's going to take like two or three years. It's going to be breathtaking. The Chinese are fed up. They want to change the system, and I think they're, they're going to be they're going to be just like just like the Lord overturning the temples and their tables. The Chinese are going to overturn the Comex tables and say we, we, we're dealing with a double gold price. Let's see if we can achieve, achieve attain some equilibrium. But it's not going to work. It's not going to work because the new mine output is not going to be there. We, we're going way down. We've got some major problems in the mining industry. Where's the gold going to come from? Well, I've got some clients, Eli, who say, you know, if we ever get to 2,000, I'm going to sell some of mine. And I, I tell them, I wouldn't sell more than 10% unless you're urgently in need, like paying off some big debts or, you know, going to law school or something, going to medical school. And they, they all write back and say, oh, yeah, I, I just sell a small amount. So if we get to 2,000 and, and most people just sell a small amount, you're not going to achieve equilibrium when the mines have not been successfully reopened. And then you get to the other steps like I described. We're going to have about four or five steps in the next two or three years that get us to 10,000. It's going to be exciting. You're going to be able to say victory, but not without a price. There's going to be a, a couple of macro effects that are going to be horrible. One is that the dollar goes away, and therefore so does the inventory supply system based on the dollar. That's a very important point. In Costa Rica here, I'm making a list of all the things that are supplied in, do by, in dollar form. I'm buying up packs of Gillette razor blades. They're only available in imports. I think there's going to be empty shelves for razor blades. I'm buying up some you know, heavy you know, bathroom detergent. That bathroom cleansers, stuff like that. I mean, as far as buying fruits and vegetables and coffee and milk and butter, stuff like that, no problem. The domestic currencies can handle that. It's the imports for the supply chain. I'm worried about gasoline and diesel for Costa Rica. We don't produce anything here. Nothing for, for energy products. Zero. It's imported, some of it's imported from, from Nicaragua, paid in dollars. It's going to be disrupted. So the victory we get in gold is going to come at with a price with the supply chain. <clears throat> in other words, chaos. I mean, what happens when trucks just can't get diesel? What happens? The supermarkets and the hardware stores and Home Depot, a third of their shelves are empty. I don't think there's going to be any gasoline shortage in the United States. I think there's going to be gasoline shortage elsewhere, other countries, that rely on the dollar to supply it. The dollar's going away. I mean, I, I have just laughable conversations with Americans here. I say, are you aware that the dollar is used in international trade? No, I thought it was just for the United States. I mean, the, the, the dumbass responses are everywhere. Are you aware that crude oil is paid for in the dollar by Asian countries? No, I didn't know. That's kind of neat. The, the ignorance is everywhere. Our nation has been dumbed down to a tremendous degree by bad economics education, by minimal math requirements in high school. We've even done away with phys ed. There's no phys ed in the United States anymore because fat boys can't play dodgeball. <clears throat> anyway. I get carried away. The next topic I'd like to discuss is a little bit about Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank recently has, well, in 2015, it lost 6.8 billion euros, which is the equivalent of about $7.5 billion. You said that Deutsche Bank could be the catalyst that takes down the whole banking system. Did you want to discuss a little bit about this? Yeah, let, let's, let's talk first in, the, in a preface, a preliminary point, about something that Deutsche Bank did Way back in 1998, I, I remember this because uh, I, was at, I was at Digital Equipment Corp., a computer company. It was IBM number one, digital number two, Hewlett Packard number three, but digital had a death event. But in the early 90s, I used to attend focus groups. I mean, some of my colleagues were involved in the non-quantitative, meaning that they weren't statisticians, but they were doing important work. They were doing focus groups and things like that. And they would say, hey, Jim and Bob and, and, and Johnny, if you want to come, we're... 
we're over at the, the hotel up in, in Little Littleton, and you know, come on, it starts at nine o'clock and goes to eleven. We got Bankers Trust there. Okay, Bankers Trust. That was a big client. In 1998, the Fed organized an acquisition by Deutsche Bank of Bankers Trust. Bankers Trust was not an ordinary kind of a bank. It had corporate clients, to be sure, but it wasn't you know, a retail bank where people would say, i got a passbook savings account and some CDs. No, it wasn't that kind of bank. It was called the Fed's Bank. It was called the Central Bank's Bank because it contained a lot of derivatives. And I call that the whirling dervish of, of, of mythical mass that the entire U.S., banking system foundation was built upon after Black Monday of 87. Black Monday of 87 was a very important point in, in American financial history because that was the event that highlighted how the United States banking industry was insolvent. So they decided that they would do kind of a, a circle jerk or a musical chairs event where everybody would start bidding up on these multi-trillion dollar derivatives and they would serve as a foundation for the banking system. It was a brilliant idea, Sir Alan Greenspan. And it, it, bought, a, it bought 10 or 15 years, but now the system's broken. All right, Goldman, I'm sorry, uh, Deutsche Bank bought, in an acquisition, Bankers Trust, which meant Wall Street could engage in all their derivative trading without regulatory oversight. It was offshored, outsourced, to Germany, okay? That's all breaking. And it, it's breaking principally, I think, with the interest rate swap derivative and all the movements in treasury bonds. It's breaking from the petrodollar derivatives that link currencies to the crude oil. It's breaking from junk bonds. It's breaking from the energy sector. Everything's breaking in Deutsche Bank. They're actually involved in every single type of banking operation and function, and every single one of them is breaking. I mean, when, you get, when you get people saying, I don't know what's going on, I, I don't see any big problems, it means they don't understand that in seven different areas of banking, everything is breaking. In other words, they don't have any idea about what's going on. They don't have the ability to perceive one single thing. Deutsche Bank is involved in every single type of banking business, and all of them are in total wreckage. The Voice told me back in 2011 and 12 that Deutsche Bank is going to fail. It'll take a couple of years because they'll do Herculean efforts to prevent its failure. And if, if they really did the right thing and could do the right thing, they would break up Deutsche Bank into about seven businesses. But then a few months later, he said, never going to happen. Because the biggest piece in there is their derivative business. And if you put that to proper mark to market, it's probably worth a few negative trillion dollars. So they'll never break it up because they'll never want to bring to light their derivative losses. And if you did bring to light the derivative losses, you would see how the derivatives hold everything together that's broken. So what are their businesses? They got commercial lending. Deutsche Bank has sovereign debt with the pigs, like Spanish government debt, Portuguese government debt, Italian government debt. They're big stockholders in the broken banks from those three countries and Greece. Deutsche Bank's involved in LIBOR with lawsuits involved in there. Uh, they're involved in the derivatives, as I described. They're involved in energy loans. They're involved in junk bonds. And they're even involved in the Russian mafia investments that were responsible for at least one or two of the J.P. Morgan uh, flying lessons out of the 50th story without a parachute. So I like to describe this, Eli, as what Lehman was to the mortgage finance sector, Deutsche Bank is to the entire banking sector. So if you had the Lehman death, however that happened, the Lehman death, if that was a crisis to the mortgage and housing sector that, that contaminated nearby banking sectors, the Deutsche Bank failure is going to be a contaminant event for the entire banking sector. I think Deutsche Bank has the capability of bringing down the entire banking sector for the West and lighting the fuse that brings down the following banks that are all teetering. Royal Bank of Scotland, RBS out of England, 
Society General, a bank in France, Barclays, big bank in London, but also Santander in, in Spain and Banca Intesa in Italy. All these banks, one, two, three, four, five of them, they are perhaps the most vulnerable. But Germany has other banks that are deeply in, in, in insolvency trouble, like Commerce Bank. So what you have to look for with Deutsche Bank, and you've got some signals. In December, for the first time, I, I posted their credit default swap price chart. It's in Borsarama, and I, I featured it in, in uh, January and compared with their December level. It was like they were around 90 in December, which means 0.90% uh, for uh, payment. It's like a percentage cost to insure your, your bond. The Deutsche Bank, uh, Deutsche Bank corporate bond had, a, had in December a cost of 0.9%. Um, then it went to 120 basis points in January and zipped up to 270 basis points, 2.7%. Uh, by mid-February. I don't know where it is exactly right now. But at the same time, you had a, a just a, a nosedive in their stock. I think it was down something like 70% in the last several months. So you combine their bond default insurance collapse with the stock collapse, and you've got the identical signals that were there for Lehman that enabled me to say four months in advance that Lehman was going to fail. These are not impossible things I mean, I love when CNBC says, well, nobody saw this coming. Well, yeah, a lot of people saw it coming, not your guests, because you don't have them on. You don't want to have people on CNBC in, in uh, July of 2008 saying the credit default swap for Lehman Brothers is rising like, like crazy and looks like they're going to die. No, you cause a stock panic if you do that. So CNBC, they don't, they don't do capable reporting like that. No, that, that's, you leave that for the hat trick letter to do. All right. Well, the last topic I'd like to discuss today is about negative interest rates. And negative interest rates are being tried by central banks in Japan and European countries. And as for the bond market, Bloomberg actually reported that $7 trillion worth of government bonds around the world have a negative return. And this is actually, um, I think they said at the time they reported it, it was like 29% of total first world countries' bonds, which is just enormous if you think about it. And so what does this mean as for the current state of the world financial system? I mean, have we ever seen, ever in history, have we ever seen negative interest rates? No. Have we ever seen the global financial system collapse? No. No, that's what's happening. Okay, let's suppose you had Alan Greenspan doing a press conference, everybody genuflecting and kissing his ring in, say, uh, 19, 1989. Okay, Mr. Greenspan, could you foresee in the future a day when the United States would have zero percent for the official Fed, Fed funds or a quarter percent? Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm sorry. That, that would never happen in the United States, Sir Alan Greenspan would say. Another guy would take over a mic and say, Mr. Greenspan, could you foresee into the future where the Federal Reserve would authorize the printing of money to buy U.S. government debt securities? Oh, no. No, that's what they're doing in Japan. That would never happen in the United States. Another guy grabs a mic and says, Mr. Greenspan, could you foresee in the future a day when the U.S. big banks would charge money for people to put cash in, in accounts? Oh, no. That's ridiculous. Could we move on to more sensible questions? Eli, these are symptoms of a broken system. Here's why they're offering negative rates. There's a big problem in commercial lending. They're not able to make money at big banks by lending to commercial entities. Big companies are not expanding. We're stuck in a vicious recession with feedback loops. There's no such thing as a sluggish recovery. Ever since Lehman, we're stuck in a vicious recession with feedback loops. So big companies are not expanding. They're laying people off. They're cutting jobs. 
So when a big bank calls up their, their buddies, they have a long-standing relationship, they call up five different companies and say, do you need to borrow some money? Let's have a meeting and a lunch. We can have some martinis, and we'll line up some big loans. And the companies say, no, we don't need to borrow anymore. We're laying people off, cutting jobs, restructuring, and shutting down certain business segments. So where do the big banks make money lending on their commercial sector and portfolio? Nowhere. So how do they make money at the bank except to charge money for people who come in with their cash? <laughs> oh, gosh. If you're a small business owner and you're cutting back, and you say, well, you know, I'm going to liquidate this entire store, its inventory, and some trucks. Sell off some computer systems, network stuff, and maybe a little dish on the, on the roof. And with all this, we're going to get about $80,000. And we want to put it in the bank because we have no use for it as capital. And the bank says, well, gosh, we have too many companies like you and small business that are doing precisely that. We can't offer you an interest rate anymore. So we're going to charge you some money for putting it away. Oh, my gosh. In my opinion, this is so backwards. I wrote a series of three articles or maybe four articles in, 19, in uh, 2003 before the newsletter. I called it Ask Backward Economics 1. Ask Backwards Economics 2. I pointed out things like a, a very low interest rate slows down the economy. Well, what does a negative interest rate do? Does it maybe bring about an even more rapid, rapid capital destruction? So I have a, a nasty description of negative interest rates. It's the last gasp of the banking system. It's the banking system attempting to breathe through its asshole. It's calling its rectum its new lungs for the capitalist system, and it's calling its excrement industrial output. In other words, the banks are shitting all over the economy. How do you think that's going to work out? Do you think that's really going to fix the banking system? No, it's a last gasp. And there's another angle to this. If you're in in engaged in a, as a big Wall Street bank in a carry trade where you're borrowing short-term money and you're investing it in long-term bonds, that's one reason the 10-year bond is having a rally. These banks are borrowing cheap money and investing it in the 10-year the bond. They're making money. So could it be that as the interest rate falls, I'm sorry, as the bond yield falls on the 10-year treasury by, say, a quarter percent, could it be that the banks say, well, we're going to continue to make that profit by charging a quarter of 1% on the bank accounts? So is the negative rate going to be exactly what the 10-year bond yield has dropped? Don't know. Don't know. But it does sound interesting. Now, this is the last gasp. Eli, we're, you know, a year from now, you're not going to be looking at some of these banks in their same condition. You're going to be looking at them in a liquidated position. You're going to be looking at them in a, in a collapsed position position. The, the saddest thing about the Western banking system right now is that they're all lashed together, the, these big banks, following Lehman. They, they, they decided, well, let's protect each other by tying each other together with big contracts and share the responsibility. It used to be that Morgan Stanley had most of the oil derivatives, and now they all have the oil derivatives. So they're all going to go down at the same time. And that's why I think we're going to see a, a major gold volcano event in the next several months. Because the banking system is imploding. They're all going to go down together. If Deutsche Bank goes down, you're going to see all the other banks go down with it, like RBS, Society General, Barclays, Santander, Bank Intesa. If one Italian big bank goes down, you're going to see five others go down. If one big French bank goes down, you're going to see five others go down. It's a domino, contagion effect. They don't want the contagion, so they lash together themselves, 
hoping that no one big bank would go down, like Deutsche Bank. It's, we're way past the situation where they can kill off one bank like they did Lehman Brothers and feed off its bones. We're way past that. The next big bank that goes down will be a systemic failure event. This is the end. This is the end game, Eli. Well, Jim Willie, thank you so much for joining us today. I guess before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers where they can find you and any last thoughts you had? Uh, sure. Uh, the website is www.goldenjackass.com. No hyphens or anything weird in there. Just goldenjackass.com. Uh, amazingly, EI, this, this May will be 12 years. Uh, so it's been a long path. I did not, did not expect when I started this for the dollar to be around at the year 2010. They've extended things with 0%. Extended things with QE and the bond monetization, which is something like a country Zimbabwe would do. We're doing the Zimbabwe monetary policy for the global financial system. And it's, it's, it's causing a, a global vomiting event. So I cover a lot of things in two reports for the Hattrick letter. It's the Global Money War Report. I changed that name for after the Lehman event because... You know, I didn't need to forecast how the banking system was going to go bust and, and turn insolvent when it just happened. So I changed the theme of the first report to the global money re report, money war report, and I, I focus on that with, uh, you know, major, major events to defend the dollar, like, like wars in Ukraine to defend the dollar, uh, ob obstructions in Syria to prevent Iranian gas from reaching the European market because the Gulf Emirates don't want their business in LNG appended. So there are a lot of major events like Russia and China going off the dollar standard for trade, especially oil. A lot of events like the Chinese spending really trillion, a trillion dollars or more of their treasury bonds to buy up assets around the world. So those are money war topics. The second report is uh, the gold and currency report, where I, I get down to the nuts and bolts, like uh, Indian demand for gold and silver, or North American demand for gold and silver. And there's an interesting point regarding North American uh, silver demand. If you add together U.S. coin demand for silver to the Canadian coin demand for silver, it is less, <clears throat> I'm sorry, it is overwhelmed. The silver demand does not, get filled by North American silver mining output. The demand for silver coins in the U.S. and Canada exceeds the mining output in North America. I should say Canada and U.S. because Mexico is different. Mexico has some demand, but uh, I don't have data on their output versus coin demand. That's a remarkable event, and that's in the gold and silver, I'm sorry, gold and currency report. I didn't get a lot of sleep last night messing up on a couple words here and there. And, and there's another big phenomenon that I cover in the gold and currency report, and that's the massive changes going on in the silver market, where 10-year-old coins now are not given the same price as a 1- or 2-year-old coin. They're called bullion coins, but the 10-year-old coins are being given a price more consistent with a 100-year-old collector item. And you're also seeing the live market for silver go completely dry. That's uh, it's kind of a side market where, you know, I've got an emergency. I, I, need, I need $10 million worth of silver to complete a certain large scale project. And I'm willing to pay, I'm willing to pay $15 premium on the silver price. In other words, I'm willing to pay $25 to $30 per ounce if I can just get my hands on $10 million worth. It's called the live market. It has zero supply now. And the last thing is the, uh, the silver, um, <clears throat> what do you call it, the silver cycle. The silver cycle is where grandma's silverware from your, you know, your dining, dining set. You, you bring up together all the different silverware from estate sales, and that used to be sold at a 10% cut less than the spot price. Now it's a premium. Well, that, that, that whole industry now is, 